Do I need to turn this on? All right, are you all ready? Before our official start? Okay, so Tara's giving us the thumbs up. So um, welcome everybody back to our second night of Reimagining Rural for our winter 2024 session. We're super excited to be back here again with you all tonight. Um, my name, if you weren't with us um, last session, my name is Jennifer Anderson and I am one of two uh, Community Vitality Associate Specialists for MSU Extension Service. I am joining tonight live in Forsyth at Forsyth um, um, group where they're hosting their session. And with us tonight, our co-host, as most of you probably know, is Tara Mastel. She's also Community Vitality Associate Specialist. She's our program leader with MSU Extension, and she is live in Lima tonight. And then we also have Skylar on um, Skylar German on with us. She's our program manager and she is handing out handling our tech um, situations that may arise. So as we get started tonight, right off the bat, we want to say again, thank you to the Montana Department of Commerce um, as one of our sponsors this year. They graciously gave us some funding to help make this program possible. And then always to the Montana Community Foundation. They have been a tremendous supporter and partner of this program since it started in 2019. We very much appreciate them. So with that, we're gonna jump into our program. Um, before I go over the notes again, was there, just Tara, anything that you wanted to share about that you heard because Tara, uh, Tara reached out to almost every one of the communities. And was there any buzz that you wanted to share that you were hearing about from the different communities? You're muted. Yes, well, first of all, I have to tell you that I am, I made a little trip today. I drove down to Lima and Dell. So I drove five hours today to come and do Reimagining Rural from Lima and Dell because they very much uh, are super pumped. They have a town of 125 people and they had 60 people on the first night and um, they have a lot of um, interest in this. So um, I just have to tell you that I am here and I'm pumped and we have a full room here tonight. So i um, excited to be here. Um, and yes, over the week, I over the last two weeks, I have had the pleasure of visiting with a few folks that um, from around the state that did reimagining rural um, that were that participated in the first night. And the thing that really struck me is I was surprised at the number of newcomers that were um, that had attended, and it was just so great because sometimes as a newcomer, you don't have an entree into town. Like you want to get involved. Well something like reimagining rules like y'all come you put you guys did a great job of putting it in the paper or getting the word out to so that beyond the same 10 people could show up and so that was pretty fun um i loved um let's see i loved um just hearing all the different challenges and so we have a lot of different communities this year and it's pretty cool to see that um no matter where you're at, if you're in the mountains in a in a amenity rich area, there's yeah. The, so this is a great map. We can't see it very well here, but oh, it's basically we got reimagining world communities all over. So um, no matter if you're in um, Ekalaka in more of the plains area of the state, or if you're in where I'm at in Lima Dell, where there is like huge, gorgeous very large um, mountains. Um, we all share a lot of the same challenges being in small frontier communities. Mike here owns the hotel in Lima and said, hey, there's a difference between rural and frontier and heck yeah, there sure is. So that's great. I think Tara brings up a great point. We had this question come up a couple times. Um, one of the, well, let me back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. No, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. I'm hitting the wrong button. Okay, so um, before we get into the slide a little bit, while well, I showed that slide about the different reimagining rural communities across the state, um, we will get back to that as that was kind of something that Terry was talking about. Just to get us start, as we started, we have a great program tonight and we wanna make sure that we give the, these folks enough time to um, visit with you all across the state and um, interact in your local communities. So just a couple friendly reminders. 
Uh, in case you didn't join us last session, Reimagining Rural is a place for Montana small towns to gather, connect, share, and learn to build vibrant, sustainable futures for our communities. In Reimagining Rural, we aim to inspire rural people to reimagine a new, different kind of future for their community. We aim to embrace different perspectives, individuals, and ideas, especially our newcomers. And it is wonderful to see so many new folks um, coming out and sharing this experience with us. We also aim to connect through shared hopes, dreams, and experiences and create positive changes. Your community is worth it. I think that's one of the things throughout Reimagining Rural that we have really tried to hit home on and impress about is that um, we can reframe the perspective and our mindset about our own communities. I mean, it's really important to do so. Um, we also really wanted to share a map of the different reimagining rural communities that have participated um, across the state. Cause we heard some folks say, well, wow, what um, Roundup did, what, they were blown away by Roundup last session. And I thought, well, we, that really seemed daunting or, or challenging. So we wanted to show you a map, um, the community, and I'm sorry if this is hard to see, but the communities that have blue dots are past participants and the communities with the red star are our current participants. So as you can see, sorry, guys. all the way across the state, all over, we are from um, Dell and Lima, which is down in the north or the southwest corner, all the way to Ekalaka, which is the southeast corner, all the way up to Cutbank. Um, and Roundup, you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there's Roundup right there. They were one of our past communities. They're about 50 miles north of Billings. Um, and they only have about 1,800 people in their community. Um, so, yeah, you many of our communities um, can take on similar projects to what other communities are doing. So we thought it'd be really interesting to share this map and show you um, the impact in the communities that are participating across our great state. So with that, we're gonna get into a little bit of the logistics of the program tonight. So again, our tech issues, if you have any problems getting on or connecting or your, uh, any issues you may run across that are tech related, um, please call our tech Skylar German. She is our program manager and there is her contact information. Um, tonight's gonna to be a little bit different than our first night or if you've participated previously. We're, gonna, we're going through the introductions, recap from previous session, we will have featured speakers. We're gonna hear our community success story first, which is Ekalaka. And then we are gonna hear from Becky and Deb from Save Your Town. And they're going to share their idea friendly method with us. And then we're going to wrap up um, and probably talk a little bit about the third session that we're going to have. Um, if at any point in time, we love questions and we love input. So please use the chat box to share during the featured speakers. We will work to respond and answer these questions as best we can. And also please remember to mute yourself because um, we have probably, well, I'm not sure what we have tonight, but we know that the first session we had um, well over 250 folks across the state who were tuning in, maybe close to 300, which is kind of crazy when you think about that. So make sure you mute yourself um, on your computers so um, we can all hear. So with that, we are going to get into our speakers. So as I mentioned, the first step is Sabre Moore. She is a PhD. And she is the executive director for the Carter County Museum. And she is also uh, probably a volunteer extraordinaire, if you want to call it that. Um, she's an ECLAC community member, a planning board uh, member. Um, she has been a part of their reimagining rules. And she's uh, EMT, I believe. So she does a lot of different things down in Ekalaka, and we are super excited to hear from her. And then when she is finished, we'll hear from Becky and Deb from Save Your Town. Um, and they're going to take us through the idea friendly method, and it's going to be very interactive. So hold on to your seats, folks. Um, with that, Tara, anything else before we turn it over to Saber? No, I can't think of anything else. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Sure. All right. So I'm going to quit sharing my screen and let Saber take over. Uh, okay. Thank you, everybody. Can everyone hear me all right? Up. Yep. Awesome. Perfect. I'm going to share my screen. Let's just do the whole thing. Okay. So. Shows me. 
Welcome again. My name is Sabre Moore. I'm very excited to be part of Reimagining Rural again. We joined Reimagining Rural for the first time in 2020, 2020 and then 2021. And then we took a little bit of break. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So Tara asked me to share the Ekalaka Montana community success story. This story is in progress. It's happening as we speak. I like to start off all my talks with the land acknowledgement. Uh, we recognize that the Carter County Museum and by extension, Ekalaka, resides on the ancestral lands of the Sioux, Northern Cheyenne, Crow, Hidatsa, Arikara, and Mandan ind indigenous nations. Everybody always wants to know where Ekalaka is. <laughs> Thanks to that earlier slide, we know that we are in the Southeast corner, uh, but this is a really fun little map of all the different highways that you can get to get here. Uh, fun fact, there's only one highway that goes to Ekalaka and one highway that goes through Ekalaka down to the bottom. And that wasn't paved until 2010. That's when the visitation to the museum really started to grow. In 2020, Ekalaka joined one of the first Reimagining Rural cohorts. And during that, we had a really amazing time meeting fellow community members and really getting together and learning about what was happening in the state. Uh, of course, Roundup was one of those uh, 2021 that we heard about, and we were really excited to see what Roundup was doing, that they were able to really galvanize around an area of getting people together to make Roundup an even cooler place to live. And that's something we wanted to do in Ekalaka as well. So in 2021, we decided to take our collective Reimagining Rural Juices and put them together and apply for the Main Street Montana program. Uh, Ekalaka became a community member in 2021. And in 2022, we applied for a grant. The grant was for, at that time, a total of $20,000. And it was for a downtown master plan. Well, in Ekalaka, downtown is the town. So we had an entire community plan that was made with that $20,000. A little ways into that project, they called us up and said, hey, would you like even more money? And we said, yes. So they increased that to 30000 And then we were able to leverage some of the reimagining of rural funds that we got through the grant program from the Montana Community Foundation and some others from the Eastern Plains Economic Development Corporation to really leverage that and come up with a robust $40,000 to go out for bid. In 2023, that became the Ekalaka Community Plan that was passed in April. And then 2024, we are back in Reimagining Rural and we're going to see what we can do with it. The Ekalaka Community Plan was funded in part by a grant through Main Street Montana program of uh, 30000 and contributions from Carter County Community Foundation by the Eastern Plains Economic Development Corporation of 8000 and then Reimagining Rural grant funds for another $2,000. Part of the process that we went through, the first thing that we did was hire High Plains Architects, which is out of Billings, Montana, to develop the Ekalaka Community Plan. What is a community plan, you ask? It's a comprehensive policy guide aimed at addressing the needs and vision of the community. High Plains Architects, we were very excited to hire them because they had recently done a downtown master plan for Haver and had a really fantastic story of galvanizing that community and bringing it together and really getting a focus on positive change instead of just kind of thinking about uh, what are some of the negatives about Haver. They were able to bring a success story of changing that narrative, changing Haver to be the middle of everywhere, which is what we talk about in Reimagining Rural quite a bit. When we hired High Plains, they had two architects that came out, Randy Hafer and John Sanford. Uh, they made three visits to Ekalaka one in November and two in the spring of 2023. And came up with this resulting plan. What the image is here is of Main Street of Ekalaka, what it might look like. So this is with adding some street trees and some really fun lights, kind of fairy lights that go through the community. And then looking at maybe filling in the gaps between the buildings. So the plan is an important first step in building a shared vision for the community to guide the design and development and pursue funding for the projects that it describes. So because these projects and others like them are figured in the community plan, we're able to get a lot more grants 
and kind of add those to the matching funds as we move forward with the projects. The scope of the plan was limited to the boundary of Ekalaka, the whole town, with a particular focus on Main Street, and it draws on background information from reports conducted for and including info about the entirety of Carter County. So we looked at some of the other growth plans, capital improvement plans that Carter County and the town of Ekalaka have done in the past, and then also used a lot of the ideas and group conversations we've had not just here at the museum through Reimagine Your Rural, but also through the Carter County Chamber of Commerce and brought all of those ideas together to get them in one spot. So we kind of go back and have a list to go through. Uh, this image here is Ekalaka in 1916. It's been colorized by the architects. Uh, this is what our main street used to look like. Some of the recommendations from the plan, they include identification of different historic renovation options, adaptive reuse, and infill development projects that would alleviate some of the challenges that we're dealing with, such as housing and a need for a diverse economic development plan. I'd also include some recommendations for the town's public spaces. So right now this is the triangle and a potential vision of it for the future as a town square. Now the triangle is currently privately owned. So some of these ideas that we have in the plan are ideas where people can just have them as suggestions. We're of course not telling anybody what to do with their private property, but providing some ideas that maybe they could adopt in the future. Uh, part of the vision with this town square is we included a flat iron building that would take up one corner of it. And that building could be apartments in the top, office spaces below, and create an income form for that private landowner if they decide to then use the rest of it as more of a town square. One of the primary items in the plan was the expansion of the Carter County Museum. This was the first image of what that expansion might look like that the architects came up with and included in the plan. The current museum, see my mouse is right here. And then we would be adding on this whole part on this side. So essentially doubling the size of the museum uh, and then returning the original entrance to there. Right now we enter kind of off of this tower right there and then adding some windows and again carrying that same plan forward of the street trees. The plan talks about the Carter County Museum for a couple of pages and when you pass a plan like this, it's really important that people get together and as a town, we've adopted the plan, but there are more guidelines at this point than actual actions or things that are happening. So a community member, like we'll talk about later in Save Your Town, has to come and champion, champion one of these ideas. Uh, in this case, the Carter County Museum is being championed by the Carter County Geological Society, which is the nonprofit arm of the museum. Now the museum itself is a county building. And so there's some really interesting partnerships there with the county in order to make this a reality. So these are the steps that the Carter County Museum has been taking for expansion. Now, we've been working on the expansion for a lot longer than you see here. It's been about 20 years of this idea in the works. Uh, a lot of it's because the museum has a inability to display most of its collections at the current building. So less than 10% of our collections are on display. That's a huge chunk of community history that is just behind different doors, just because we can't put them on display in the public building. There are also some other issues that we have for preservation. So bringing all of our collections on site and having a real HVAC system to care for this, uh, care for the collections is a huge step forward. Uh, in 2019, we participated in what's called the Collections Assessment Project, which is through the American Alliance for Museums. They send two people out, one to look over the building and the other person to look over the collections and make recommendations toward eventually national accreditation. Uh, they found that a expansion and renovation of the current museum would alleviate a lot of different issues, including, most importantly, the need to provide a modern building and exhibition space worthy of our internationally renowned collection. Uh, in July of 2022, we partnered with the Institute for Tourism and Recreation Research 
to do an event survey of the 11th annual Dino Shindig, and we found that non-resident visitors spend an average of $400 per person in the region just when they come to the Shindig, which is only a two-day event in Ikalaka. In March 2023, we participated in the measurement of museum social impact, and they, they delivered a report that found that we increase all areas of continued learning and engagement, increased health and well-being, valuing diverse communities, and strengthening relationships. So not only does the museum have an effect on the economic development of the community, but also the social development of the community as well. And we were able to leverage this data forward and working on the expansion. In 2023, the community plan was published and it was presented to the Ikalaka Town Council in May. And we began discussing the next steps that were outlined in the plan. Those steps involved two feasibility studies. The first one, a feasibility study about the museum, what the expansion means, how the expansion is actually going to be done, what the building looks like, the different areas that we wanna include in the building, for example, becoming a platinum lead building. So having a lot of energy saving options there. And then in December, we completed a fundraising study. Uh, that fundraising study told us kind of areas that we can start really getting a lot of money toward this goal and making this a reality. In February, just a couple of weeks ago, on February 1st, actually, we held our very first fundraising committee training where we trained local community members that had identified themselves in that campaign fundraising study as people that wanted to take up this challenge and really make the museum expansion happen. So what does the expansion look like now? So I showed you that first image. This is the second one that we came up with during that uh, feasibility study for the building. Uh, on the top, there are a number of solar panels. The kind of side of the building itself, it looks like a rainbow color here. It's not gonna be quite that dramatic. Uh, it's actually going to be the museum um, where the museum resides in geologic time. So you'll see kind of a stratigraphic column here of what the different layers of rocks look like around Ikalaka. So a really great way to bridge the building into the surrounding landscape. Again, this is the current building over here. So it will carry forward some of the aspects of that building, the sandstone look on the outside. This middle part is the Medicine Rocks hallway. And so that Medicine Rocks space will really look like the Medicine Rock State Park that's near Ikalaka. There'll be sandstone columns, look like sandstone columns within it that have the holes that are the same as the medicine rocks. And then there's a space for a community area, a new gift shop, and of course, expanded areas for the collections. And then our little ecolactic dome that houses our planetarium in the back. This is what the floor plan looks like when we got together and decided, you know, kind of things that we wanted to have in the floor plan. Of course, the dinosaur hall was a big feature of that. Ikalaka and the Carter County Museum have a hundred million years of comprehensive history, all the way back from when we were underneath the Western Interior Seaway to present day when we're still living and jiving and moving. Uh, the current building is this teal piece. And so phase one is the renovation of the existing building and then also uh, putting up the walls, installing the dinosaur hall and natural history hall and the entrance which of course includes restrooms. We're going from two restrooms to eight bathrooms, which is exciting because the museum has the only public restrooms that are accessible in Ikalaka on a regular basis. And then of course, including a children's area, we'll have after school programs and the Ecolactic Dome, which is places where we not only have the planetarium, but also have the opportunity to host different community events like our regular geological society meetings once a month, and sewing soiree, craft corner, things like that. Um, in the back of the museum, there are the collections. So one of the cool things about this area is that this will be a visible wall. So you can actually look through and see the collections from the exhibit floor. Uh, we'll have a prep lab where you can see the dinosaur bones actually being prepped out and talk to paleontologists. And then we'll also have a real boardroom instead of just setting up some tables in the middle of our collections, which we do now. And then a library where you can actually go in and conduct your 
local genealogy and different research researches that you might have, not just on communities in Nikolaka and families in Nikolaka, but also on geology as well. We have an extensive library, both on site and off site currently, and it'll be amazing to get that all in one spot. So today, where we're standing, the renovation and expansion of the Carter County Museum is listed in the Carter County Capital Improvements Plan, uh, which was published in 2016 and updated in 2022, the Ikalaka Community Plan 2023, and then the Carter County Growth Policy, which we are working on in 2024. So part of our discussion here tonight in Ikalaka is going to be talking a little bit more about that growth policy after everything's said and done with Reimagining Rural, and then talking about how the museum fits into that, as well as some of our other plans. So I know that was really fast. My last slide. So there's my name. Um, I'll drop my email in the chat as well, if you have any questions. But I think I have a little bit of time to open it up for questions now. And I'll stop sharing. So thanks, Saber. We do. We have about five minutes. If anybody wants to ask any questions, you can put them in the chat box or unmute and ask away. Um, <laughs> we, <coughs> excuse me, we decided to go with the the community story first. Um, we thought Eclac was a great example of some things that they had accomplished um, over time. Um, so this is what you can do when you take an idea and you run with it. And this is a few years later. So we're going to go back when we talked to Becky and Deb about the, the idea-friendly method of how you get started with new projects or ideas or when you um, have that person who's a spark plug in your community and wants to do something. Um, so the question is, will we share this recording after it's over so we can rewatch? Absolutely. It will be recorded and shared. Sure. And Saber says she'll share, she will share her slides out. So a few more minutes before we transition into Becky and Deb from Save Your Town. Is there anybody ha that has any questions or wants to learn more? Okay, Carrie Lewis asks, city growth policy versus community plan, what's the difference? Yeah, so the community plan was really, again, a collection of ideas, things that would be fun to see happen, but not necessarily things that have to happen. The city growth policy, uh, which for us is a full county growth policy, is something that we're all getting together and putting a survey together, answering that survey. And then these are all things that are going to happen that the county wants to happen and is going to put measures in place to have happen in the next five to 10 years. So more of a doing plan than a uh, idea plan, for example. So the Saber, the community plan was part of that, is, if correct me if I'm wrong, but it was part of your, the downtown revitalization plan to right, correct? So correct. with the Montana Main Street program, they um, kind of recommend you do a downtown revitalization plan and it brings in architects to kind of look at the, truly look at the landscape of your downtown and what it could look like if different present different ideas and things of projects to move forward with where the growth policy is a much more formal government document. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And the growth policy includes a lot of a lot more data. So kind of what what are the nitty gritty, like what soil does the community sit on? <laughs> uh, what are some of our disaster plans? So really, really detailed. Uh, the community plan was only about 35, 40 pages, whereas the growth policy is probably going to clock in closer to 300. So, um, question. Um, so, but you're, you guys are all working together to develop these things. So it's a comprehensive kind of a holistic approach because I think it, is that correct? Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. For what ECLAC is doing? Because what I have seen sometimes in the past is city growth, city or county growth policies don't really necessarily address beautification issues or downtown revitalization, like, or recreation issues, like if they, um, or topics, they don't seem to include those very often. So I think that's a great way to approach um, as you move forward to have a comprehensive, comprehensive, holistic approach of things. Yes, and they are using the community policy to inform the growth policy. So um, last question before we transition to Becky, Becky and Deb, where does the funding come from? Is it federal, state, or all in grants? And that's coming from Custer County. Yes, 
So in the case of the uh, Ecolaca Community Plan, it was a combination. So we used the reimagining rural money as sort of a seed. So we got that $2,000 first. We knew we wanted to do a plan. Um, about the same time that Reimagining Rural gave us that money, the Montana Main Street program announced a grant program, uh, which they're doing right now <laughs> at the moment. And we were able to say, okay, well, how much, we have $2,000. What do we need to make this plan happen? Uh, we asked Haver, we asked Roundup what some of their plans had cost, and they gave us that figure of about twenty to $30,000. Uh, that was what the M Main Street plan had been advertised at that point, that they were giving out grants of a, about up to 20000 to communities that you could apply for. So we applied for the maximum. Uh, they were able to then announce that they had more funding later on that we got, and then we you're responsible for a certain amount of match as part of a main, Montana Main Street grant. So we were also able to leverage some funding from the Eastern Plains Economic Development Corporation, which is our local economic development corporation. And there are different ones for each region. So that's a really good place to go to. So that helped us have $10,000 in match money that then grew that um, up to about 40 to 50,000 for that. Uh, for the museum expansion, it's a combination of private fundraising, of people giving us money uh, through Carter County Geological Society dues. It's also some loans and then some grants that are both federal, state, and local grants as well. Uh, some examples of good state grants are, of course, the Montana Office of Tourism. There's a lot of fantastic grants for that. And then the Foundation for Montana History, which supports museums and historical projects, and then some of the bigger national grants that it's helpful to have all this data for us uh, through like the Institute for Museum and Library Sciences. So one, okay, one more, one more question. How involved are the businesses, are the business owners in the Montana Main Street program? So the Montana Main Street program is primarily run in Ecolaca through the Carter County Chamber of Commerce. And we have quite a few business owners on Main Street that come to those uh, Carter County Chamber of Commerce meetings. Uh, not all of them uh, are part of that, but we do try to regularly get information out into the paper and inform people what's going on uh, with the Montana Main Street program. And then I am the one that fills out all of the reports uh, as of this year on what's happening and then trying to communicate that, that to just show that things are going forward, work, working on projects and places where you can really join up and uh, galvanize to do more things. Great, so thank you Saber so much for speaking about what is happening in Ecolaca and um, I just the fantastic things that you all are doing down there and how you took your spark plug and your idea and have ran with it, we really, appreciate you um, joining in tonight and sharing and Equal Echo being a part of the program. So if, if folks, if you have any more questions, please put them in the chat box. Um, Saber has shared her email. You can contact her directly. You know, Forsyth already has about their downtown plan. And that is the most wonderful thing about this program is that we share, we share a lot. So um, if you, any other communities, um, are interested in that, please reach out to Roundup or Ecolec or anybody and just ask questions. Cause we're kind of all in this together. Um, so with that, um, we just want to thank you one more time, Saber, for, for joining us and coming on tonight and sharing this. And we are going to transition to Becky McCray and Deb Brown, and they are going to present on their idea friendly method. So we started out with the, the, the big bang. And now we're gonna talk about how to ignite those little spark plug ideas that people randomly come up with in their community and how you can how your community can be more idea friendly. So we'll go ahead and um, turn it over to Becky and Deb. There we go. <laughs> I hit share and then you lose your mute tools and you have to go look for them again. <laughs> All right. Deb, are you up and ready to go? Yes, I am. <laughs> Caught you unaware, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Forgot I was on mute too. 
Perhaps okay. we should say, so, I'm from the land of the Pascagoula here in Mississippi. And she is Deb Brown, and I am Becky McRae, and I am in Oklahoma, which is the land of lots of Native peoples, um, land that was variously um, through the hands and taken from Osage and Cheyenne and Comanche and Cherokee and lots of places. So um, we're going to talk, um, you'll get to see a lot of Deb's beautiful photos from her most recent visits over the few past few years to Montana, some works that she did there. And we're going to share lots of cool and interesting ideas for you because like Jennifer said, all the best ideas are the random ideas. And one group of people who came up with some great ideas are from Miller, South Dakota. There is a group of teenagers there who are actually working on making their community a better place. And like a lot of your young people, they feel like there's nothing to do here. And so they came up with a whole bunch of these ideas they wished they had. And one of those was a movie theater. They wanted a real indoor sit down with popcorn movie theater because most of them had never experienced that through their lives. And now they're in a town of 1400 people, which is a fairly good sized town in South Dakota, but that's going to be a challenge to get a real movie theater. And so the young woman that you see holding the mic there is named Abby, and she's the one who took the lead on this. And as she presented this idea in a room full of adults, uh, one of the adults said to her, that idea is too big, it will never work, and you shouldn't even try. And I'd like you to be kind of shocked by that. But I'm sure many of you are not because people have done this to you too, haven't they? They have thrown brick walls in your way. And we know what those brick walls say. It's like, we tried that once in 1972, or that's not how we do things here, or that is never going to work, or slow down, let us ask more questions, give us time to talk it over again. And so the thing that occurs to me is like, did that adult secretly hate Abby? Were they like worried that she was going to succeed in getting a movie theater? And if they didn't take action, she would get it done and they better stop her. No, they, they were trying to protect Abby from failing, from failing in public where they knew that Abby would get embarrassed by failing. And so in order to protect her, they told her to not try and prevented her from learning. And that is the kind of thing that a lot of people are worried about when they tell you something like, that'll never work. They're worried that you might fail. So the people who sound the most negative usually think they're helping. And that same motivation is behind all the brick walls and bureaucracy that we've all had to sit through. And so people in the past imposed every one of those regulations and restrictions to keep us from failing. And some of it sounds kind of reasonable. Slow down, let us ask more questions sounds kind of reasonable if your plan is to avoid failure, but it's a bit of a trap because we're terrible at judging failure. <laughs> Author Margie Worrell said that using the latest brain imaging technologies, doctors were able to figure out that we're actually far less likely to fail than what our brains tell us. And so while we're warning people, slow down, you might fail. Our brains are lying to us <laughs> and overestimating that risk of failure. And the doctors also found that our brains are really good at sticking with the status quo and denying any risk that would come to us if we don't take action. And the risk of not taking action is what Will Rogers pointed out. Even if we're on the right track, we can get run over if we sit, just sit here. So when we're making decisions that affect our community, the real choice isn't between how things are right now, where we're safe and everything is fine, and the risk of change, which is scary and out there somewhere. This real choice we have is between the change we're going to create when we choose to act and the change that's going to run into us when we fail to act. So while we're discussing things over one more time, not rushing into it, the world is changing around us. And if we have learned anything in the past few years, it is that the world really does change and quite quickly. But we have survived before. Our communities, our people are resilient. And we have endure, endured those boom and bust cycles. And we have been through commodity price crashes. And we have seen epic changes of, in agriculture and 
we've lived through epidemics and natural disasters. And, you know, most of our communities have lost our economic reason for being, and some of us more than once. But we have reinvented ourselves before. And right now we are reinventing the way we do things in our communities. In my hometown of Alva, Oklahoma, which is population around 4,000 people, there's a group of moms who decided that our old 1950s era playground equipment at the city park was out of date and unsafe. And so if you can blow that picture up on your screen, it is worth looking at that 1950s playground equipment. You've probably played on some of this. Um, and look at that sharp sheet metal on the front smile on the boat. Oh my gosh. So yeah, it's not exactly what you would call safe. So they decided we maybe needed a little new equipment. John just realized how scary that pit stuff was. Um, they decided to get some new equipment and they started working on it without going through what you might think of as the huge, usual bureaucracy. This group of moms started sending text messages. They set up a group chat. They figured out what they wanted and what would work in our climate, which takes quite a bit. Um, and how much it was going to cost and how to raise the money. And they did it. They succeeded over the past decade. They have updated play areas all across the park and they didn't even bother to set up a 501c3, not until years into the process. They just started using the communications tools that we have now. Now they did not know it, but those moms were using the idea friendly method and you start with your big goal for your community. That's the thing that you feel is going to improve quality of life. So that might be like kids playing safely. And then you use that goal to gather your crowd, like inviting people to the message group. And then you turn your crowd into a powerful network by building connections. Do you know anybody at city hall? And then you and your newly powerful network can accomplish that because lots of you We'll take small steps. So someone will say, I can research online. Someone will say, I can make flyers. Somebody else will say, oh, well, I can ask my friend who works at City Hall. Now, they really did. Those moms really did take small steps. They did not start with that shiny new equipment that was in the one pretty photo. They actually built up to that. They first improved that old scary equipment and removed those dangerous sharp edges, gave it a new coat of paint and actually made it a lot safer. So the big goal was this playground that was safe and fun for kids of all abilities to play together. And they called their group, the Alva Friends of Play. Now, no matter where you are starting from, whether you feel like your town is or isn't very open to new ideas, the Idea Friendly Method helps you get from wherever you are now to a place where your community is more open to new ideas, build stronger social ties. And absolutely, you can start on your own no matter what anyone else in the community is doing. So what we're going to do here is have you write down your big goal. And one of the questions we've already been asked is, first of all, how long will we have? And the answer is going to be five minutes, as you can see there. I'll start the timer in just a sec. But do you have to share this with other people? Can you have like, can you have like one table that has one idea? Can you have your own idea that you don't tell anybody? Do we need to write all the ideas on the board? Just work do whatever works for you, no rules, right? Like do what works for your community. So what we want you to think about is the idea that really gets to the heart of you, what you want for your town. So you might, if our town had the indoor movie theater, or if our town was letting kids try their own ideas. So that's what we want you to write down. And we are giving you the full five minutes because we know that with the larger groups in some places, some of y'all need a little more time to take care of this. So we're going to give you five minutes starting now, and we hope that the timer will run on screen appropriately. Looking good. And thank you to everybody that's sharing their screen. It's great to see your groups of people working together. For your home and you working for your community. Feel free to throw anything you'd like into the chat. So if you have 
an idea you want to share? Or if you have a question. You have about two minutes remaining. Got about 45 seconds, so get those last minute ideas out there. And absolutely, everyone is welcome to get their your ideas into the chat box if you would like to share them. You're down to 30 seconds. And that is time. Deb? Let's go in the idea-friendly method. I like to start with take small steps because you can take action right away. Now, what would be the old way to take small steps in your traditional community leadership? <laughs> the first steps are hold a meeting and write a plan. And you would meet and plan and meet and plan and talk over everything a few times in this picture, you recognize these guys looking over your shoulder? I think you should also do this. I don't think we should do that. The chamber said they might do something like that, so we shouldn't step on their toes. You have to keep meeting until everything is planned out and nailed down until everyone agrees. What's the new way to take small steps? 
Well, you start with the world's tiniest way to test the idea right now. And then you learn from that and try a slightly bigger step. Now, this is how Pascagoula, Mississippi is working on their big goal of building their entrepreneurs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Many of their people, they face some extra obstacles, discrimination, or they lack the resources to borrow the money and buy buildings before they can start a business. So they put a dozen tiny houses on an empty lot and made it a tiny business incubator for entrepreneurs. Now, potential business owners can start with just a table or a booth just for the day at one of the market events. And if that's successful, step up to a tiny shop, then keep growing. City officials said that these tiny business spaces have helped create wealth through entrepreneurship, improved equity, and seeded new businesses that grew large enough to move up to full spaces in their downtown. Now, lots of ideas are going to fail. Maybe, maybe most ideas will fail. That's why we take small steps. Author Clay Shirky says, Failure is free, high quality research, offering direct evidence of what works and what doesn't. So by keeping those tests very small and immediate, we can reduce that cost of failure to practically nothing. We don't have to spend a lot of time judging an idea when we can test it out right now. We waste less time planning and spend more time doing and quickly learning. You're gonna be visible in the community more quickly. As long as you're in that meet and plan mode, stuck in a meeting room, nobody can see your progress. When you take small steps, people can see you're taking action. And then more people are drawn to you to become part of what you are doing. Akalaka has a good story there. Saber shared with us about her champions. I was pretty happy to hear about that. The Geological Society stepped up and said, we wanna be part of this. Now, when you take small steps to the process of going into business, when you apply those steps, you get the innovative rural business models, tiny temporary ways for your entrepreneurs to get into business more quickly. This is the approach the Zuni um, Pueblo population has taken. They're using it to help their art, uh, artisans grow into their next step. And they're using pop-ups and mobile vendor carts and shared vendor shelters. They're helping their people experiment their way into larger business successes. More successful tiny businesses means a more resilient local economy. So look back at your big idea for your community. What are some small steps you can take right now who can you call or text today, right now? And we're gonna give you a couple of minutes to write that down or maybe send a quick text. And do feel free to share it in the chat room with us as well.
Here is your two minute warning. I'm kind of keeping an eye on the discussion in the groups there where you've got larger groups. And as long as I see active discussion going on, I'll let you continue to roll, but you've got about a minute and a half. Got about one minute. Thanks, Carrie, for sh sharing about the dog treat business. And that is time. So I know you have great conversations going in your groups. And I understand if you need to take just a second to continue to wrap that up. But in order to be respectful of everyone's time, we have to continue to go. <laughs> so we're going to keep moving on. Any ideas you come up with and want to share, feel free to throw those in the chat. The next part of our idea friendly method is gather your crowd. This is you gather your crowd with that big idea, one that excites people and makes them feel like they are going to play a role in it by taking small steps. Now, the old way to gather a crowd to work on an idea is to assign people to the committees. And so you've probably seen emails like this. I know I got one that said, we are planning for our annual programs. Please see attached committee list and let us know which ones you're willing to serve on. Thank you for your support. And, and you've gotten emails like this too. Um, I just got one that said, the committees are where the magic happens. And look at the committee picture. Do they look like they're having magic happening? No, they do not. So the State and Sublimity Chamber of Commerce in Oregon actually tried something very different. They killed off their committees. Their new way is just to gather people only when needed. They use their big goal. Elena Turpin told us they actually spend more time telling people how they make a difference in the community. She said, then your organization becomes a movement that people can get behind, not just another volunteer opportunity. See, there's this difference between please serve on our committees and becoming a movement that people can get behind. And what this looks like is the difference between committees and activities. I was in Caldwell, Kansas, population about a thousand people, and I noticed the older people introduced themselves by the organizations that they belong to and serve. So one said, I'm on the Chamber of Commerce Executive Committee, I volunteer with the Historical Society, and I'm on the Alumni Board, which is good. The younger people introduced themselves by the activities they enjoy doing. So one said, I love to garden and um, I like to read. So some friends and I do a book club and I have a little free library and this is good also, but you want to move from only asking people to join your committees to inviting people to participate in activities that they will enjoy that also you help them see will make a difference in the community. So what could it look like if you had your crowd together around your big idea, if you focused on just the activities that people enjoy doing? And we are gonna give you five more minutes.
two minutes. You've got the one minute warning. Thirty seconds. And that is time. Now, Deb, before I hand it back to you, I just want to say, look at some of these really cool ideas and action steps that are popping up in the chat. We're very excited to see those. I know that y'all are going to save those and share them back to all the participants later. The town of Pullman, Washington had a dirty sidewalk problem. Every time it rains, dirt and leaves and stuff wash out of the streets and onto the sidewalks. You can bet it's pretty messy. Well, their big goal is to have a clean and welcoming downtown. When Becky, Becky visited, she did a walk around with them, and they told her that they've done cleanup projects in the past, but those darn sidewalks still get dirty. Well, after the group walked around downtown, they talked about another cleanup day. <laughs> no one spoke up to take it on. One guy tried to pin it on the chamber director and said, the chamber did the last cleanup day and they should do another one. Well, Becky stopped that idea and said, if no one wants to take the lead, then it won't happen because it isn't your priority. And of course, that made them a little bit uncomfortable. Then a business owner named Willow spoke up. Now she's at the table at the center back with the white tablecloth behind the vase of flowers. She put her hand up and said, I'll clean my own sidewalk. That's a good start, but if it's just Willow, it's not enough. How do you get from one person cleaning their own section of sidewalk to enough people cleaning their own sidewalks on an ongoing basis that they don't need to keep scheduling cleanup days? Well, you have to start by cleaning your own sidewalk. Then you take pictures, put it on social media, hashtag it, clean your own sidewalk day, and then tag two friends. You want to make a big deal out of how anyone can do their own sidewalk. Now, make it less of a committee and more like a social media challenge. This worked for Pullman. Other merchants followed Willow's lead, and a bunch of merchants started sweeping their sidewalks on Wednesday. Then the city joined in and they send around the street sweeper on the following mornings. This is your best way to attract those people who are initially resistant. If Willow had tried to convince everyone during the walk around or at that meeting to change their minds, forget doing a cleanup day and all sweep their own sidewalks instead, and also try to convince the city to change their work schedule, you know everyone would have resisted. They would have said, this will never work. That's a terrible idea. Willow did not try to change their minds. 
Instead, Willow attracted them by taking her own action and she made it easy to join in. Willow started a movement that people could get behind. Okay, see that curved shape? This is the motivation curve. Now you might wanna draw this in your notes or do a quick screenshot, quick photo. You are the most excited about your idea. So you're at the top, at the big end of the graph. There are a few people like you who are also super excited and willing to do a lot. And then it tapers off from there to people who are less excited and willing to do less. That dash line is where the old formal organizations end. The people on the big side of the line are on the committee, but most people are outside the formal organization. Down on the long tail, they're interested in the idea, but they've got low motivation. They don't contribute enough to be worth including in the old way of committee hierarchy. We've been looking for volunteers by focusing on the big end, the tasks that require the most motivation. We need someone to serve a three-year term on the beautification, beautification committee. Or we need you to give up your entire Saturday for hard physical labor on cleanup day or it doesn't count. Well, let's flip this model over. We start with your excitement as the foundation. Think about Willow cleaning her own sidewalk. The key was to give other less motivated people small but meaningful ways to participate. Just clean your own sidewalk. And then we can look for volunteers with even the tiniest level of motivation. And those tiny contributions stack up. Professor BJ Fogg's behavior model said that the people contribute only if you make the size of the step you ask them to take to match the level of their motivation. Maybe you'll get more motivated to do later, but you wanna start tiny. It doesn't matter who's on the committee and all the small contributions matter, they count. So what about the people who don't like your idea? <laughs> don't worry about the people who pull in different directions and do not get sucked into the conflict. These are not your people and you can't lose people who were never yours. So let's take a look at how can you make smaller, more meaningful ways for people to be a part of your idea. Think about that for a minute. Well, for five minutes. What are some smaller, even more meaningful steps? And go ahead and write that down.
Deb's dog says you have two and a half minutes. <laughs> You have about one minute, one minute. Okay, so that's time. Now I will add one other note. I know that many of you are having great conversations in your room and I will note you're going to get the recording of this. So if you decide that you're gonna just turn our volume down and, and work, that's fine with us, but be sure to go back and catch the parts that you missed because it does help. Now, put any ideas you've got in the chat, any questions, anything you wanna share with everyone, or you can send us private messages and we will share our contact info. And I see other good ideas popping up in here. So we're gonna now turn our crowd into a powerful network by building connections. Now in Idaho, economic developer Jessica told me that she is dying to get a microbrewery in her town. So that was her big idea. And I kind of think she may be in the only town in Idaho left without a microbrewery yet. Now, the old way, the traditional way for Jessica, who works for the Economic Development Committee to build connections and get a microbrewery is to present this idea to a meeting of the Economic Development Board. And then the board can take a vote. They can refer it to the Subcommittee for Business Development, who can order the feasibility, feasibility study. The, the expert can look at it and write up that plan, the feasibility study. They send it back to the subcommittee. The subcommittee can review the study. They can take a vote. They can refer the vote back to the main board. The main board can look at it. They can take another vote and talk it over one more time, slow down, let us ask more questions, and then maybe Maybe they can add it to the five-year business development plan. And then they could offer some incentives or tell Jessica she should go recruit an established microbrewery away from someone else. So there it is. There's that old way system that you recognize the brick wall, slow down, we want to ask more questions, trying to avoid failure. So what if we could avoid failure without just adding more ways to slow things down? So in this case, why don't we just start a homebrew group, right? Like, like just bring together people who like to brew their own beer at home, get them together in someone's backyard, let them share ideas and just talk. And you know what's going to happen is they're going to drink beer. And after about three beers, one of these people is going to say, I could run a microbrewery. 
And all these buddies are going to be like, yeah, you should do that. And you probably know somebody that was a microbrewer who made that kind of leap. But if they have this supportive group behind them, they'll be more successful. These are the people who have gathered their crowd. They're going to help them build connections to suppliers, other brewers who have made the leap or connections to the agencies, connections to the rules and agencies they'll have to deal with, help them work out problems, staff the microbrewery at the launch, but they will be more successful because they built connections. Now we know that community happens when people talk to each other and people like to talk to each other. And when the community around us is more attracted to an idea, then we are more likely to at least consider it, David McCraney, the author of How Minds Change said. And that's why you don't start by presenting the idea to the board or to the council. You start by attracting others. Then you can go to the board with a groundswell that is easy for them to join. Professor Brian Uzi from Northwestern University says his research shows Getting more diverse people involved will get more innovative ideas. Different people know different things. And people who were raised in different families or different cultures or different places will have ideas that are even more different. And we need those different ideas because our 1950s ideas are kind of like that 1950s playground equipment. Getting a little out of date needs some updates and some additions if they're going to work for us today. And when you apply this concept of building connections together to the concept of entrepreneurship and local business, you've got the rural jobs creation strategies. Yolanda Almaguer from Brownsville, Texas, shared their small business group. They just get together once a month so they can tour each other's businesses, see what they have to offer. They can ask questions of each other, and then they get these answers in familiar terms and not from experts, but from their peers. So letting entrepreneurs support each other and connecting them with the resources they need, those are the ways that we create jobs in rural areas today. And more small employers means a more resilient job space. So here's another one of those times for you to have some conversation in your rooms, look back at your big idea and that you wrote down. And so what, how could you get people together and actually do it? So do you have an equivalent of a homebrew group that would support your big idea.
two minute warning. One minute. And that is time. Welcome back. Now you'll see the whole idea friendly method on the screen and you can shoot a quick screenshot if you'd like. Let's review. You start with your big goal for your community. You know, one that excites people and makes them feel like they can play a role in it. Now you use that goal to gather your crowd and become a movement that people can get behind you turn that crowd into a powerful network by building connections and you and your newly powerful network accomplish that goal together by lots of you taking small steps. You don't have to know all the answers if you can be open to new ideas. Being open to new ideas doesn't mean giving up who we are. We can be open to new ideas while we stay rooted in tradition. Iowa State University studied 99 small towns for a period of over 20 years. In that time, those towns experienced just every kind of change. Some, like Webster City, Iowa, lost a huge manufacturer. Others gained a new business. Some lost a local school. Some had big growth in their schools. Some were hit by natural disasters, while others were spared. What the researchers concluded is that no matter what happened or didn't happen, the towns that prospered the best were the ones that were open to new ideas and welcomed new people into making decisions about the future of their community. Being open to new ideas means letting go of judging ideas. When someone shares an idea with you that you might think is stupid, instead of saying, that'll never work, the idea friendly method means pausing and then asking, how could you take small steps? You know, it's much more polite anyway. And maybe they'll come up with an approach you would not even have thought of. Remember Abby in the movie theater? Now Abby and her friends knew something that adult who told her not to try it didn't know. They knew the idea friendly method and how to take small steps. They said, let's make a temporary movie theater. And the teens borrowed the school auditorium. They picked a kid's movie and invited the grade school students to be the audience. Abby and the other teens ran the tickets, concessions, and projection. And for one day, they created a real indoor sit-down movie theater experience for those kids. That was an experience those teens wished they could have had when they were kids. When you tell people like Abby not to try ideas you think will never work, you miss out on the amazing experiences that your community can create together. 
You want to move from voting ideas to testing them. Main Street expert Jackie Waldman told us, when you vote, the same people tend to lose over and over. So quit voting and just let people test. You'll be learning which ideas work by actually doing them in very small tests. Author Margie Worrell says the question we have to ask ourselves is, how will inaction cost us one year from now? What are the negative consequences of needing to talk everything over one more time, get one more expert opinion, write one more plan? Years ago, Winoka, Oklahoma, a town of about 900 people, got a grant to redo their downtown street, streetscape. So a little bit like Ikalaka is doing. So lights, sidewalks, everything. And so they started through this whole process. And eventually the architect comes in and drops three different design plans for their downtown onto the city council table and says, in essence, pick one. Well, there's eight city council members plus a mayor in a town of 900 people. They're, they're not architects, they're not engineers, they are not urban planners and they have none of those people on their staff. These are volunteers. These are business owners and they are retired people in the community. They do not have any way to judge from a set of paper plans, which one of these is going to be the best for their town, not just now, but decades into the future. So they looked at the renderings and they brought them up to discuss and they spent years discussing those plans. And it took them a long time to pick one. So what is the cost of inaction? What is happening to the value of their grant dollars while they're holding one more round of discussions. They're going down every single day. Well, the new way is to take a copy of the plants and then you take your duct tape and where a plan calls for a ramp, you take your duct tape and you tape it off on the sidewalk and you label it ramp. And if it says there should be some plants, then you go drag some potted plants and you set them where it says there should be plants. If it calls for brick in an area, go borrow some bricks and set those out along the sidewalk or wherever it calls for bricks. And you are building that real life rendering. And this is so much deeper than just a paper rendering. And then you can hold a pop-up event like this. And Winoka actually knows how to do this really well. They do it every year. And then invite the council and the entire town to come in and walk through the real life rendering and see how it's going to hold up. And then do the same thing with plan number two and testing it this way. This is how you get past the fear of failure and the risk of making a huge, expensive, a long lasting and embarrassing mistake and make a better decision for your community. And we have to test these ideas because all our towns are different. And so even if you find an example where someone tried the same idea in their town, it will not necessarily apply to you. Think about how long that architect spent in Winoka or Ikalaka. A day, three days, I think Saber said, three days. We better test those plans. See the differences, if you think back to the map and the way your communities are all spread across the state, your communities are so different. You can borrow ideas from each other, but you still need to test. It will never go back to the way it used to be. We have to start from right here and go forward. And you are the person or the people in your community who are best positioned to spark the movement that people can get behind. And you're building the small steps and the tiny experiments that are going to add up to change the shape of your town. So we have about five minutes right here and I'm gonna run the timer. But what I want to do here is I think that Deb, we should start our Q and A right about here. <laughs> yes. I think it's time. We would, what we encourage you to do at this point is to think about what is the immediate next step. So, you know, there was the question about, you know, maybe we need to reach out to the people and get a quote on the on the downtown planters. Well, you know, can we send a text? Do we know somebody who works there? Um, can we get the phone number? So, what immediate thing can you do right now? And we'll pop this up here. 
to let you know that we do have, um, if you want to share the idea friendly method in a shorter version, we have a 30 minute video that you can use. And it's at this address, save your dot town slash gift. You can use this to share it with folks that could not come for the big thing here. And I think we've got like seven minutes. <laughs> And I want to address um, when at ACES talked about privately owned damaged sidewalks mm -hmm. and they suggested bringing the people together and prior prioritizing the worst ones. Well, let's talk about bringing the people together. Please don't invite them to City Hall. Invite them out for a beer or for a cup of coffee or outside in the park. Make it a comfortable location for everybody and start there. I do like this idea of the, they buy the materials, but the group fixes them. This is, and especially how you say that to the person, if, if the opening line is, man, your sidewalk looks awful. Like that's really hard way to get some cooperation going. <laughs> and so your opening line might be, we have this great opportunity where we've got a group that's going to be able to do the work. Would you be able to purchase the, the materials and we can bring the group and do the work for you? See, that's a different, that's a whole different opening line than you're an awful person. <laughs> yeah, they're your friends and neighbors. Okay, we are open for your questions. Big Timber turned the lights on that. I love watching Big Timber like they're in the dark, they're in the light. <laughs> okay. I got a message here. Oh, you're welcome, Winnett. Winnett? I want to make sure I'm saying it correctly. You know, Custer County talked about a pop-up rec center. Ooh, I love a pop-up anything, first of all. That sounds like fun, actually. And pretty easy to do, right? Find some kids and ask them what they want to do. Don't you know, assume. We don't assume that you know what the kids want to do. Oh yeah. Ask them what they want to do. Tara's working on ideas there. All right, good deal. So I wanted to go all the way back. I was scrolling way up here. And one of them was from Forsyth. It was like splash pad, rec center, paved bike path, brewery, town square, paint the town and an outdoor art museum. And then there's more in a minute, right? Like there's a lot going on at Forsyth with Jennifer. Um, but I wanted to pick on one, which was the paved bike path. And that came up, I noticed it right at the time I was talking about like start your own homebrew club. So if you want a paved bike path, one of the first things may be like holding a bike event or a bike ride so that you get a lot of folks together because it's the perfect opportunity for that conversation to happen. What are the great, what are the best locations? Let's ride some different routes and see what people like. And if we have some sample routes or, you know, we've already picked the route, then let's ride that route and talk about how much better it would be if it was paved. Yeah, we were in Pennsylvania and there was a group that really liked the idea of inviting um, gravel bike riders in to try their trails out. Trails weren't groomed even really. They would just right. had said, we got a trail here. And so they invited different kind of, you know, those fat tire riders to come in and try the trail out. And it brought lots of new people to town too. Yeah. See, they were, they kept saying, oh, the, the trails aren't done yet. And we're like, people will still ride them even if they're not done yet. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a new experience for them as well. Carrie asked us, uh, where can we find ideas from other small rural community successes across the U.S.? I hope that you've signed up for our e-newsletter. They're free. If you go to savior.town forward slash sign up, every week we share stories of what other communities are doing, what their challenges are, and some ideas. That's just one place. Work with um, the extension people, with Tara and Jennifer. I know they have resources as well, and they've worked with 53 communities now in Reimagining Rural. I think I got that number right. That's a lot of communities in Montana and they have plenty of stories to share as well. Okay, so I'm gonna throw some links into the chat for where you can get stories. Um, and I'm gonna cheat a little bit because I've got three of them. So, um, so here's the next one. So the first one I've thrown is, is savior.town 
slash articles. And that is where um, Deb and I post occasional articles. This next one is smallbizsurvival.com. And that is where I post small town business articles. Um, so there's town and a lot of tourism stuff there. Um, all right. So next would be building possibility. Articles, yeah, dot com articles. So, and then here's the articles there. I'm going to get you this link, folks. So here is Deb's building possibility articles. And so then there's mine, which is right here, which my link's longer. So hold on one second while I grab it. <laughs> I need to make a short link. Okay. So here is link number four. So there you go. So like there's some places that we share stories and you are always welcome to hit us up with a question. If, um, if you remember a story we'd said sometime and you're like, whatever happened to that story, then we can try to dig it out for you. Okay, so I think, Deb, correct me if I'm wrong. I think we are up to our time limit. Indeed, and I actually put our email addresses in because yes, if that's you correct. have a story you want to share with us, we want to hear it too. Oh, by do all your means. And do ask us questions. We always answer your emails personally. So especially if you've got like a specific topic, like you want to hear like the Pennsylvania bike trail story, then just, just hit us up. Okay. Um, were there other questions, Deb? Did I skip over anything? No, I think we got it. Okay. All right. Thank you very so, much for having us. <laughs> We brought just a little closing thing that is something that we believe and something that we think a lot about. And so we're going to read part of it to you. And part of it's not even on your screen, but you can get a copy of it at the address that you see there. So Deb, why don't you start us off? Oh, give me a second. I have the <laughs> you, old... Or I can start it. It's okay. Sorry, Let me guys. Get... We are a community of possibilities, not of problems. We're action takers. We're optimistic. It's not about what this town used to be. We have people right now, assets right here, and we can take action right away. We don't need another plan, another committee, or another meeting. We can do it now. Okay. We take action right away. And we create the moments that show what this town could be, even if it lasts only a little while. It doesn't have to be permanent to create possibility. We don't care much about titles or who holds official positions. The people who do hold titles may not think like us, and that's okay. No one can stop us from doing the little things that really matter. We'd rather help 10 people try their own ideas than hold a vote to pick one winner. Voting might be more efficient, but efficiency is not our goal. Community is our goal, and we try everyone's ideas. We don't let statistics or negative reports beat us up. Those numbers are nothing but a snapshot in time. What we do next is up to us. We aren't trying to change our town to try to attract other people. We are valuing all the people who are here now, and we are creating the, the future of our town together. That means everyone, every single one, people of all ages, all backgrounds, all incomes, people who are new in town and families who have been here for generations. All of us have ways of doing things, culture and gifts to share. We all want a thriving town that will have a future for generations and we thrive by doing more business together. We celebrate the entrepreneurs and business people, the dreamers, makers, and artists, the experimenters, performers, and crafters, the bakers, upcyclers, and junkers, people who sell in bo booths and homes and people with businesses and parking lots and trucks. Together we prosper right here where we are. We have everything we need. We are creating the community we want one small step at a time. It's nothing short of a revolution in how we build our town together. And welcome to an idea-friendly town. Thank you so much for letting Deb and I play a tiny role in that today. Thank you so much, Deb. Thank you, Becky. 
great to hear. We here in Lima and Dell are thinking hard, lots of lots of wheels turning. I think this is just a really new idea and um, my take is kind of like got a marinated in a little bit. And so we're gonna share all the, hopefully you guys, we probably already have sent your slides to us. So we'll share those out with the planners and um, people can look through those and we'll share. We have a, our Facebook group and we would love to share um, a lot of these resources that you've shared. I I look at, I read them every week because they're just really great approachable ideas for small towns that don't have a lot of paid staff around that are doing stuff themselves. So I just wanna say thanks again. You guys are just so great. We appreciate you so much. Okay, can I share? Okay. Um, whoops, I'm going backwards again. I'm using a mouse and I'm not used to it. Okay, so as we begin to wrap up this evening's conversation, if you have any, we did hear, we got some feedback from the last time that folks really wanted to have more of a local conversation than to engage across the state. So we're going to honor that. And um, if you would like to share in the chat box, you most certainly can. Um, your most important topics of your local conversation. We've done a lot of sharing already, but if you want have more to share, you're welcome to do that. We will keep this open and stay online until 8 p.m. However, if you also want to spend this time um, engaging locally and continuing to, to talk about your idea-friendly um, methods that you came up with or ideas that your community came up with, um, we want to give you some time to do that as well. So just a couple things, housekeeping things, as Tara mentioned a little bit. We have a Facebook page and there is a QR code for, code for that if you would like to um, join our Facebook um, group. And we do share a lot of information and communities are starting to share information on there. We really want that to be a space for our communities to share with each other and build social connections and learn from each other and what, what you all are doing. We also have a QR code for our response cards. You should have some of those um, paper copies at your, um, at your location this evening. So you can do them by paper or you can go, if you want to do them online, you can um, scan the QR code and also do the response card that way. We really, really need folks to complete the QR code or the response cards because those are one of the things that we're using for an evaluation tool for us to know um, kind of the impact that reimagining rule is happening. So before I stop talking, just want to shout out a promo for our last session that is coming up. Um, we, the um, speak, our featured speaker is going to be Rebecca Undum from the small town of Oaks, North Dakota. And she um, moved back to her small community and is a farming with her husband. And she, in 2019, she founded a nonprofit organization calling called Growing Small Towns. Um, and they've done some terrific things there. And we're going to spend the whole time talking with her because she is up, she's going to be our expert presenter and then also share um, what they have accomplished in Oaks, North Dakota. Um, she has a podcast. It is fantastic. Um, so Join us um, for our last session of Reimagining Rural, where our main speaker will be Rebecca Endum. So, with that, um, I will keep the chat box, or we'll stay up. We'll stay up until 8 p.m. And if you have questions or comments you want to throw in the chat box, please do so. We'll be monitoring in that. Um, but also, in the meantime, if you want to continue your local conversations, please feel free to do that as well. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, from across the state. Uh, we just love visiting with our rural communities and hearing what is happening in your towns. So thanks again, everybody. Okay. Okay.